Okay. Wow. Well, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I am your host, Boo Ada, and this is Master Random. And before I get to my next guest, who I am extremely excited about, I just want to talk a little bit about time and the time that we spend doing things or nothing or binging on our favorite shows or, you know, spending all our time on our career or spending our time on all on, on just our family, right? Or just spending time on ourselves, right? I, there's no blanket statement for how time should be spent, but whatever you're doing with your time, it should be productive, you know, yeah, you can spend a little bit of time doing nothing, but don't spend all your time doing nothing. It should be beneficial to what you want to be down the line when you look, when you look up ahead. You know, yeah, we're not going to know exactly where we're going to be in the future, but we have this time now to, to focus on where we, how we could get there, Right. Spending time on the decisions that we make, spending time on our crafts, spending time on maybe fostering the talents of our little ones, right? Fostering, nurturing, sort of the same thing. So, and I I think I only think about this now because I have, I have a little one and I, I don't really think about myself that much anymore. It's. It's mainly my mother, my my other half, and and him. So, this is something I just wanted to share. Uh, you know, something I think about daily. And yeah, I want to lay down and not do anything when I get home from work. But also, I want to play with my son. I want to I want to take care of of our house. You know, I want to spend time with my other half. <clears throat> I want to be able to do everything but also everything in moderation right it has to be manageable we can't just do anything and i had a conversation with my uncle recently and he was saying yeah you know it's great you want to do all these things and spend your time on all these things but you have to have focus you have to place focus on the things that actually matter and you'll get further when you place focus on things that that matter to you rather than placing your focus on everything, right? You don't have to place your focus on one thing, but don't place your focus on too many things, right? Because then you're spending your time doing all kinds of other stuff and then you lose focus and things get blurred and things don't progress and things don't grow. So, yeah, just take a look at our, Take a look at the time that you have. And if you're older, you're kind of seeing, well, man, don't have that much time left. But the irony, I guess, for the lack of a better word, is that there's a lot of time in the day. And how are we spending those hours, those minutes, and those seconds? Is it on our phone, right? Is it ignoring the people we love? Is it concentrating on the craft? To be the best at something, what is it? Because like I said, there's so many facets to this life that spending how you spend your time isn't a blanket statement. Everyone's on their own journey and every journey takes time and there's little journeys within the big journey. So before I start going off too far, I digress and I would like to introduce my next guest he was the eighth governor of guam when he was elected in 2011 and served two terms until 2019 he was a senator from 1999 to 2011 uh he is former governor eddie bazacalvo and i've had the privilege to be able to talk to him many times throughout my life uh you know growing up at his house and going going and having conversations with him and, and the boys and you know it's it's cool that I have this show now and we can share 
a conversation that we did back in 2019 when I talked to him on his very last day as governor. And then also three years later as a, as a normal citizen. And if you go back to the episode in 2019, that was more in an official capacity. And the, the conversation that we had this year is, I wouldn't say a complete 180, but you know, you can, you can tell the you can tell the difference and either way it's he's such a great conversationalist he's he's a smart man and he knows his shit so i'm i'm excited to share this conversation with you so without further ado enjoy my conversation with former governor eddie baza calvo check it out I didn't really. Three years. I, I was thinking three two. Years. I was thinking two and a half. But yeah, going right on, after I going left, right? Three years. Yep. Yeah. And, and I tell you, you know, I remember the first time. I bits and pieces of it, but today, you know, it's it's three years later. My hair has grown a lot longer. It I've has grown, grown some facial hair. Is, is there any uh, inspiration as to the reason why you're growing it so long? It's why not? <laughs> when, when you're out of politics. <laughs> And you're 60 years old, and you've got a full head of hair. Why? You know, actually, it had to do with COVID, when they shut everything down. And when they shut everything down, you know, my normal, you know, once a month going to uh, uh, get my hair done, mm -hmm. cut, keep it cut and closely cropped, people, most people remember it. Yeah. That went away. Yeah. And then as my hair started growing... Um, and even when they loosened up the restrictions, I was like, okay, I kind of like this. I, and it's just continuing to grow. I'm not too sure when I'm going to get it cut. I don't think you ever know. Um, when, it, I, when I was growing out my hair and my hair came down to the small of my back yeah. at its longest, uh, there, was no, there was no set decision. I think just one day I was like, I think this is it. Yeah. And you know, for this, done. and for me... This is kind of reckoning back to 77 and 78. You know, I, I, I remember my hair, uh, you know, in those days I grew it pretty darn long and it gets kind of bushy because, mm. you know, I live in Guam. Yeah. So kind of looking, my hair kind of is going the same it was, you know, um, uh, 40 years ago. Uh, but it's just that it used to be dark brown. Now I'm, I'm platinum, bl platinum blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Salt and pepper platinum blonde. <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, three years uh, out of, after leaving office and being interviewed by you, long hair, facial hair, uh, and I got a good Johnny Walker blue with me and a, and a little cigar. Uh, what, what times have gotten better for me. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> the tide's turning your way. Are you recording this, sure. by the way? Yeah. yeah, yeah oh, I sure. great. Okay. So, <laughs> We're on. You know, you know I, I got to tell you, the reason why, I, first of all, that I'm drinking some Johnny Walker blue. Uh, and sucking on a cigar here is because number one, I can't smoke it because we're inside. I don't want to, you know, turn on the, the 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 smoke alarm. You know, my original intention was to do it in your backyard. Oh. You know, your your ultimate comfort zone. Yeah. Um, I just started getting you know back into recording, so yeah. uh, I had an episode last week recorded, and I just told my dad I was like, I'm just gonna leave my gear. Oh, that so been, it's just easy. We right? could have done that. And yeah. You know, you know what's good about this the, one? The, but, well, it's not going to be our last conversation. Yeah, so I'll do it maybe I, nah, some the next time around. But yeah, yeah. But, you know, I figure I got this good old, good old uh, cigar with me. You had a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not only do, does it make you feel better, but I'm pretty sure you know this alcohol and this tobacco. I'm sure it'll kill the COVID virus. <laughs> so uh, you I'm know, a true believer. I, I, I'm a true believer that with this, the antiseptic qualities of, of the of the Johnny Walker Blue. And the toxicity of tobacco, <laughs> I don't think COVID has a chance. <laughs> Not a chance at all. <laughs> so, I mean, now that you're looking at at government from the outside mm. or just Guam as a citizen, right? Yeah. Uh, and just being a part of the whole uh, COVID pandemic, right? Wow. Not as a not as a as a leader, but now as part of the part of the um, the mass, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what's your what's your outlook on it? Well, yeah, again, three years out of office, you know, uh, out of being a decision maker, the decision maker now being you know citizen Eddie Calvo, 
and being a citizen Eddie Calvo for three years, or actually, you know, going almost four years, but also being a citizen uh, in a time maybe for the two and a half years we've been, a, you know, a lockdown mm-hmm. and an executive order by a governor on an emergency, right? Um, and 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 <sighs> being uh, impacted both as, as a father and as a husband, uh, as a business owner, as someone who who you know who you know who lives in Guam. And I'm seeing the impacts of, of, of COVID and, you know, some of the decisions made uh, by our leaders on how to move forward to deal with this. And my, I guess from, you know, perspective I have, and I'm going to try to put it in a, I, I like analogy. So mm-hmm. kind of similar to, you know, I don't know, I'm 60. Anyone who's about 60 years old has probably been in a hospital. So, you know, I've been in a hospital uh, and, you know, I've, I've been checked in in a hospital. I don't know if, you, if, you know, you're not as old as me, so... Uh. I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital. Yeah, it, during the pandemic, I separated my shoulder Ooh. and uh, had to go to the hospital. <laughs> well, and I, I yeah. put that in perspective, huh? What happens when you're in a hospital? Who decides everything for you in a hospital? Um, it should be you, right? No, your doctor. When okay, you, okay. Once oh, you get oh, in what, the, what you're gonna? I, yeah. is, is this like an emergency or is this somehow uh, you've been checked in okay, in the hospital? Okay. And yeah, you're right. Every you're usually always in control of everything, but ultimately. Uh, once you're in that hospital, whether it's an emergency or, you know, you're checked in because of some sort of procedure mm-hmm. and it's either pre or post that procedure. But usually, you know, um, in fact, you, you know, it, I've dealt with administrators of hospitals. When you see the, the even the administrator of the hospital and they're talking to a patient, um, usually when the doctor walks in uh, and the doctor has, you know, has a an opinion or, or, or advises you on what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you're not going to hear an opinion, even from the administrator who technically is a top person in the hospital. You're you as a patient and listen to your doctor and even the administrator and all those nurses and staff are going to listen to the doctor uh, on w- what you are to do. And you, okay, uh, Eddie Calvo, you're going to sit here in this bed and for the next week, uh, we're going to give you this and we're going to give you that. Right, right. Uh, and you're obviously you're going to be wearing this bed gown and, uh, you know, and this is what's going to happen. And, you know, 99% of the time the patient just listens. Now, the reason I bring that up, it's kind of like that on steroids and what's happened to our community, uh, and, uh, the United States and the world, mm-hmm. you know, with COVID coming and how it came. And, you know, it was, uh, again, a, a new type of, uh, pan, you know, this new pandemic, um, there's so many decision makers in either business and government in society. But what had happened was it's like the doctors and the medical profession became the preeminent advisor to decision makers. So whether it's a mayor, a governor, or a president, they, they, they had a either group of advisors or a key advisor mm-hmm. that was in the health care. Usually it's a, and I'm not just talking Guam, it's a doctor. Right. It's a group of doctors. Um, uh, it's a, the public, the public health authority. It's the hospital authority. An advisory group. Advisory group. And um, in the beginning phases of this um, pandemic, uh, uh, you know, nearly three years ago, um, Decisions that were made by mayors, by governors, by presidents, uh, uh, or, or prime ministers were all predicated on what advice was given by uh, this group or individuals that have supposedly knowledge of the science uh, and of medicine. And at different levels, and too, at different right? Level, yeah. And obviously, you know, kind of like what happens in a hospital <laughs> where, hey, you listen to the doc. It, it's interesting because what has happened and a lot of the edicts and the mandates and decisions being made and a lot of them crossing into, you know, civil liberties, mm-hmm. uh, even for the most uh, democratic of, of, uh, of locations around the world, including Guam, which, you know, is patterned after the American, uh, you know, federal and local system of elected leaders, uh, representative government mm-hmm. with, with an elected chief executive. Uh, but man, all of a sudden, these edicts start coming in on, you know, remember in the beginning, roadblocks? Right. 
not being able to leave your house, it, not it, even it was being almost oh a yeah borderline police state. It was police state, and it, not even going outside. Right. Um. You know it, and to that degree. Now, what has happened is obviously different communities have um have adjusted based on two or three years. Some of them are still very draconian, uh, which means is they're very you know hard nose hard nose mandates right. Uh, for you know vaccines in order to work at a certain place vaccinations in, in order to to be in a certain area uh, like a restaurant or a gym or or, or whatever we need to do this to do this yeah. we you need to get yeah. this oh yeah to go here social distancing right. sanitation requirements wearing a mask and at the time originally it was outside and inside right I think in Guam, it's still even outside. Yeah, here, I, th- you know, I think where... the people dropping dead in the videos yeah. right, that were so, freaking people out in the beginning. And I think, and again, that's what's happened. It's just interesting from my perspective because you had the, um, you had the, 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 the doctors. Uh, and and I, by the way, I'm not saying it's wrong. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying it, it appears that all decisions being made by uh, differing leaders was all based on the advice given by these medical health authorities. Right. And, you know, and now as we are, you know, nearly three years into the pandemic, uh, and I think in Guam near two and a half, or, you know. Uh, March not, you know, 2020, it's, so about yeah, so it's a couple nearly, years. So yeah. yeah, a couple years. So it's, and also in Guam, which is more draconian uh, and more stringent than maybe other American communities, mm-hmm. um, you're still having this emergency uh, um, um, that has been called by the chief executive. And still a lot of uh, uh, um, mandates. And now, you know, again, it's all it's all um, based on what community is. There are certain things that the president of the United States tried to do in a national level, but you know, remember, there's been some Supreme Court rulings on right, that too. Right. Um, so, given certain, requiring contractors, well, like Leeway, exactly. contractors so that, to that was knocked out, right? Or at least when it comes to private businesses. Uh, that's not conducting business with the federal government. Right. But, you know, when it comes to, let's say, employees of the federal government, when it comes to those contracted to do business with the federal government, um, um, you know, there's still those requirements mm-hmm. based on the contact with the federal government or its or its employees. But obviously now you can't tell a business, you know, what to do, uh, which is what President Biden, you know, said you got to have everybody vaccinated. So... Now again, it's things are adjusting. They're adjusting based on the decisions being made by by leaders of different communities or by court cases. Right. So it's an interesting thing. <clears throat> but yeah. I, anyway, it, well, you know, it just it just seems very. Um, it gets very confusing, right? We have all these, we have all these restrictions and requirements and stuff like that, and then we're watching, um, you know, football on TV. Where they're packing stadiums, sixty thousand strong, right? Ninety thousand well, strong. You got, you got. There's different areas, and you go. Like I said, you know, I had some uh, family members. Remember, my daughter got married last mm-hmm. year, mm-hmm. and so you know, her and a bunch of uh, our relatives and friends, for whatever reason, went to Miami. Right. And when they were in Miami, obviously, you know, Florida is one of those places that has never been shut down since day one. <laughs> right. So it was almost shock at how open uh, Florida was mm-hmm. in terms of you no know, no restrictions or very little restrictions uh, on on a person and what they do where they go and you know how they are to be masked or not um and but coming from a place like Guam you know it was almost culture shock yeah so even now i think in Guam when we've seen when you watch a football game or a, or a, you know a, you remember where a few about a year or so ago you watch a basketball game or, or some activity, and you don't see any fans right, right. on on the, the there's no fans, just people yeah. all, players playing, even so, including soccer fields. People on Zoom, right, yeah. watching it. <laughs> but now you go, you watch the Super Bowl, you watch the playoffs, mm-hmm. you're watching basketball games now that are within you know uh, closed facilities, um, and in some place they're all packed. Now in some places it's um, it's still masked when you go inside the like let's say a gym, closed gym. But when you go to a football game outside, everybody's yelling and screaming, and no one's wearing masks. Uh, and even when you're, when you're um, in these closed facilities, you know they say when you're eating, uh, it's okay to take your mask off. So people seem to be eating con- t- continuously <laughs> for the two or the three hours of the game. 
<laughs> and everybody's drinking and eating, and right. they're all, they're, you know, there is no social. No, I'm, I'm now, eating. Now, the law I'm official. Eating. I'm eating. <laughs> so you're, you're saying, hey, what the heck? <laughs> and it's interesting, and I laugh at it. Well, I don't laugh at it. It's almost, I'm almost like, It is wow. almost comical. It's almost know? comical. <clears throat> because, you know, heck, I've seen the most, you know, and, and the Super Bowl. I saw some of the most, whether it's elected leaders, uh, especially in L.A. and California, mm -hmm. who have sh shut down their cities or their state and forced everybody to wear masks uh, in any in any uh, venue, um, and um, uh, including kids that have to wear it, you know, six hours out of the day, whether it's in pre-K all the way to a college level, mm -hmm. and yet. Uh, and, and celebrities that are also, you know, poo-pooing anyone who's and looking down at anyone who's unvaccinated or who takes their mask off. Mm -hmm. Yet, when I saw the Super Bowl, I'm seeing all these liberal woke uh, uh, celebrities and 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 athletes, and I'm seeing governors and mayors and 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 all these city council men and women that are again they are. Uh, of course, what are they saying? Oh, I held my breath when I was with this person. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Really, it was. It's it's comical, and it and, was inside, but and, the, I mean, the hey, windows were open. And I'm not. Hey, you know, I'm I'm a different type of guy. You know, I, I wouldn't have. You know, obviously as a Republican, I wouldn't have forced mandates on. That was be, one of the most difficult things for a, a liberal. I'm, I'm more in the libertarian, mm -hmm. you know, part part of things. So making a command decision to tell people to restrict their civil liberties it's heavy weighs heavy on me so but you know i'm not i'm not in the i'm not in the hot seat right but if you are in the hot seat and you are going to restrict the civil liberty including putting a kid in a mask for 6 hours out of the day and telling everybody that you know you um if you if you're not wearing a mask and you're not 6 feet apart uh then you're you're contributing to either killing people around you uh, or you know, cause uh, you're becoming a bane to to society. Yet then, at the same time, you as a person are going to a fancy restaurant, um, like like the governor of California did at mm -hmm. a French the French diner, and he was at a grand all time in a really crowded restaurant, drinking his fine wine, or like like I said, the mayor uh, of L.A. saying that he was with, by the way, an ex athlete who has HIV, mm -hmm. uh, and you know who I'm talking about, right? And is is at an at risk individual. Of course, he's saying he took the mask off and he held his breath. I, I'm thinking, don't you know if you're going to do something, at least you know practice what you preach. Right. So for or all like these, the Speaker of the House, yeah, um, Nancy going Pelosi, to get a, going to get a haircut, yeah. right? And taken off her mask. Remember the beginning, and that was in the beginning phases when we when there was still so much question marks. Right. So I've right. seen a lot of hypocrisy in 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 a bunch of folks that are imposing these edicts on civil liberties, yet they're not practicing, in fact, uh, what, they're, what they're not only preaching, but they're ordering the people of a, of a community uh, to, to be imposed on. And so, you know, I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, you know, it's, it's very understandable maybe in the beginning of the pandemic, sure. right? There was, like you said, so many questions. We had we had nothing mm -hmm. to really base, base any thoughts or opinions yeah. on. And we just had to go with what was being told to us, right? We yeah. didn't know nothing about the virus. And then months go by, and then you start seeing people well, getting raffling, you know, raffles. I've been trying know. to keep <laughs> up with it because I know it seems that science changes with every new variant. But, uh, you know, you do have, you know, you know, the issue on, you know, so I understand, hey, social distancing, keeping clean. You know, ever since it started, I used to kind of guy that, I guess I got a big nose, yeah. but man, I, I used to scratch my nose all okay. the time. Ever since COVID, I never touched my nose, huh? <laughs> so I always got this, uh, and I always have hand sanitizers, so I'm always keeping it clean. You know, I haven't been sick. I did get COVID, mm -hmm. but man, compared to the flu or the colds uh, that I used to get before COVID was more, and also being, being governor, you meet a lot of people, mm -hmm. but I also think I used to rub my nose a lot. Now I don't, and I use a hand sanitizer, so it works. Um, but, but... You know the 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 these you know again the mandates on the mask on the social distancing on the vaccines yeah and just I go the back fact to, that, yeah, that well, we well, haven't that we haven't like well, laxed a little yeah, bit you know yeah, over and, the and, last and couple and years what, is, right? what has been revealed and it's most recently you know we've been forced to wear masks and yet now you know they see in, unless you have that is it the K95 there's only a couple mm. of masks that work right 
but everything else oh sorry don't work <laughs> yeah, yeah so whether you know the gators everybody's got away. these fancy material uh, i mean uh um a cloth mask cloth mask right absolutely worthless mm -hmm. Uh, your paper mask, you know, again, they're not as worthless, but still pretty worthless. You're going to get it. It, right. it, it, um, it doesn't take much. So again, this is now the science is, you know, they're telling us this. So I go back to that thing has evolved. Um, I remember originally I would hear Dr. Pobletsky and Dr. David here in Guam repeating the same words right. that were being said by CDC and the, Dr. Fauci. The uh, echo chamber. You get that vaccine, you will never get COVID you will never be able to transmit it. That's why you, all you unvaccinated people, you're gonna be pariahs. You're gonna, you are, you're lower than the low. You are kind of like in the biblical times, you're the leper. Right. You're gonna be put here in the, in the corner. And those of you who do, but you, everything, you, you're you okay. become, you qualify to win some cool shit. Yeah, yeah. and guess what? <laughs> uh, and now, of course, it's the new variants that know you get the vaccine, um, you still, can catch COVID. Right. Mm -hmm. You can still transmit COVID. You won't go to the hospital and die, but you can get it. And by the way, um, now you're saying, okay, maybe the third, you need a fourth booster. I mean, if you're leading, look at the recent things, a fourth right. booster. Yeah, yeah, I think that came out and, of Israel, right? And yeah, and even that, if you get the fourth booster, you know, it, it may last only four months. <laughs> I don't know about you folks, but uh, now, you know, pretty soon it'll be every other month. So you, you just wonder where this is all going. <clears throat> and then, you know, and then of course, I, I, you know, the most recent, of course, already the, um, the, uh, the, the folks like Dr. Fauci and all these other ones are, are poo-pooing this new uh, study done by uh, three uh, professors from, from, you know, one of them from John Hopkins. Mm-hmm on you know the mortality rates of communities and you know what what did this lockdown do depending on what community you know they had the lockdowns not 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 the pharmaceutical side such as taking a vaccine but the masks mandates the the the, the forcing people to stay uh in certain locations like you have to stay at home remember the stay at home orders um not allowing you know uh people to that are unvaccinated to go into uh certain facilities uh, well, when it, when the study was done, um, the difference in mortality rates from the most liberal states, when I say liberal, I mean more libertarian mm -hmm. where you are allowed, you know, very open, like a Florida <clears throat> and you, you compare it to places like Guam or New York that were really California, California right. that were shut down. Um, uh, you know what the difference in the mortality rate was 0.2% in terms of more death, 0.2%. So, you know, obviously no difference. pissing off a lot of the, you know, the folks that were, that have been, you know, moving on all these force mandates because it's showing that, you know, and this is just on numbers used by uh, and, and taken by, you know, through the CDC and through the federal government that, you know, there's been, doesn't appear to have been any success or any more success in controlling at least the death rates uh, for these communities that that did these draconian measures. Yeah, you so know, it's and, interesting. And, and there's even places in the world where they're ninety to a hundred percent vaccinated, mm -hmm. and they're still getting yeah. they're still getting cases. They're getting still getting surges. Yeah. Hey, right? and for me, you know, I'm not. I, I'm you know, I took the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Some in my family. So did I. Yeah. yeah. Some of them have gotten vaccinated. Some have not. Um, and and with that, you know that. You know, for, for certain people that are, you know, that's why you focus at the at-risk. And obviously, the at-risk people are folks that have diabetes, hypertension, you know, uh, heart disease. Uh, you know, they're, 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 they're vulnerable. For sure. Manumco, older people. So, you know, you, you got you to, gotta, you know, really encourage, you know, for me, it's focus on, on the high-risk people and ensure that they're, you know, let's say they get a pulsometer, that they got test equipment, uh, testing, um, um, you know, equipment, by the way. Even now, we're finding out some of this testing stuff with the new variants aren't inaccurate. Right. The, but be the, that as may, the the test that they've been using since PC. the beginning of the pa pandemic lost its EUA yeah. <laughs> uh, because they because the new test they say um, can differentiate between yeah. the flu and COVID. Right. So I mean, you're kind of asking yourself, like, okay, well, did the old test 
was the old test not able to differentiate between the flu and the COVID? Is that what we've been yeah, dealing yeah. with this whole time? Right. Yeah, and and, and, the, and and the basis of all this, I'm not, you know, I think we should look at it all holistically, both on education, on on having the vaccines available for those that that feel that they need to take a vaccine, uh, testing equipment, uh, and whether it's uh, uh, if you're feeling, you know, the, the oximeter, pulsometers, mm-hmm. to make sure your oxygen levels, uh, you know, is adequate. Uh, testing to see if you're positive or negative, um, all the all the therapies, the treatments, right. you know, whether it was amount, I have heard monoclonal antibodies were, now they're not, but there's also d- the different um, types of treatments that are now becoming available. Um, so you know, uh, strengthening our health institutions to in- to uh, to ensure that we can handle both the COVID uh, infected folks in the hospital as well as the regular patients. Yeah, and- but but <clears throat> the one thing is, this whole idea of a government forcing it down, you know, mm-hmm. the, this cookie cutter approach. Right. You know, you know, they're saying there's, I, I remember one time saying, oh, there's no, nothing, nothing uh, dangerous about a vaccine. How can you say that? You know, there's each person in on his, is in her own or his self has, you know, is a unique person. Right. It's not a one size fits all. It's not all. a one size. Some people have had issues with vaccines. So, you know, for folks, I, I have a sister that, you know, has a history that, with vaccines that, you know, she had some inflammatory issues. Yeah, I had a friend also yeah. in the States. He, he said they decided not to take the vaccine because his wife but actually pe- has issues with taking vaccines. And, and they were penalized for it. No, none of this issue, oh, I have this issue. The only thing for, I think was a religious uh, uh, exemption. But yeah. even with religious exemption, I don't think anyone accepted that. So I'm, I'm seeing all these forced mandates. But now you're hearing in cases to cases, and some of them may be minor, uh, of side effects and whether it's, you know, Heck, what I did, I got a little eczema. So nothing big, but I yeah. did get eczema. I never had eczema before. Mm. Um, but for other folks, you know, for some young males, uh, heart, you know, heart attacks. Right, myocarditis. Right. Yeah, myocarditis. So, uh, in fact, what was just most recent? And I listened to Dr. Pobleski this morning because there was reports of one fatality as a result of, of the vaccine. And then, of course, she was very careful in mentioning her words. And she said it was not the main factor. It may have been a contributing factor, so even now things are evolving. Right. So, are, when you when when a chief executive is ready to make a mandate on, on taking away a civil liberty or forcing an injection, I, I, I go back to what I was saying earlier. Some chief executives give the mandate and they don't follow it. They don't wear the mask. Uh, they don't abide by the rules that they had set forth. Uh, but also, as they give that um, mandate for, you know, let's say they're all workers in government to, to get a shot. Are they prepared for potentially that one person or two persons or more that has an imp- that, that has a, a negative impact on their, uh, in their health? Um, and, you know, so I'm wondering, you know, if, even if it's just one, who's, who's going to be held responsible for the vaccine, right. especially if it was a mandate. So that's why I, I get very, I, I'm very wary of, of a central government dictating things. Unfortunately, there's a bunch of young, uh, your age, a bunch of young woke people. You know, when I was in, I grew up in the 70s. As young people, we don't like t- government telling us what to do. And the right. more government forces things down our throat, the more we were wary of things. But I'm seeing a bunch of woke people, young people especially. The that, definition of woke has changed apparently? Well, it's if you don't follow what, and for whatever reason, now they're, you know, they're, they seem to be in line with the CDC and with elected leaders like President Biden or governor, you know, our governor. And if you're going against it, uh, you know, they look down at you and you're not fun following the policy that has been for, set set by the established powers. So what used to be considered, well, anytime the government forces you or tells you to do something, you're, you're more wary of it. It appears the woke people are are more, you better follow this, and if you're not, damn you. <laughs> we're uh, canceling you. We're canceling you out. Is it crazy? I just crazy. I, and you may explain, <clears throat> I'm 60, you're a young guy. Yeah, I don't I, understand I, I still people. don't. I still don't understand canceling myself, right? And, you know, it, it, it's going back to the beginning of the pandemic, right? It's just trying to really understand what, we're, what we were going through and how things change, and we're expecting things to change, as mm. you said. When you get the vaccine, things are going to change. We're going to make sure everything, uh, uh, everything is going to go back to normal. But it really didn't. It's almost as if things got 
progressively worse in 2021, yeah. right? And you know, it, I see a, a bottom line different thing, and how how different folks in, in positions of authority um, have dealt with this crisis. And I'm talking about both sides, and, and you, know, you don't want to go too sub, but both on both sides of the spectrum. You know, these liberal progressives, Democrats, that believe in authoritarian, hey, this is how it's going to be done. And, you know, and, and it's way to, to well, what used to be the right now is the left, because now it's, you know, socialistic form of government, government knows best, you follow it. Towards the other side, which is, you know, and, and more on the Republican side, which is and libertarian, um, which is, hey, I don't want to follow anything in the government. This I. Now you got to watch out for that too, because then you become anarchy. If you have no centralized order, right. you got anarchy. So you know you got to look at both sides of the spectrum. But but in a nutshell, I do see there's when you start kind of going closer to to towards the middle, and as you you're going as you as you're in the right side or in the left side, there's a, there's a philosophy in governance. And some of these elected political leaders. They may not be far, far, far right or far, far left, but they have their leanings to a certain degree. On one side is, hey, I'm, you know, I love, you know, they're both people in power, positions of power better be, and especially if they're elected in democracies, because they want to know, they, they want to do what's in the best interest, for the best interest of the people, right? Mm -hmm. They want a better community. Some folks, they, they say, hey, I, wanna, I, want, I don't want our people to die. I want to, you know, we got to do this. So, but you know what? I got most of the information. Kind of like a, acting like a, like the doctor or like the daddy and the mommy. Right. But with that, there's an understanding that, well, most people are a bunch of kids and are, don't have the, the knowledge nor the intelligence to make decisions of their own. So big mama or big daddy uh, is going to protect you sometimes from yourself. So that's where these mandates come in. On the other end, there's a bunch of people which I'm more prescribed to. Is hey, you know what? I'm a governor. I'm a I'm a president. I'm a mayor. I got a bunch of smart people around me. I hope they got I got. But you know, and ultimately, I kind of I believe you know I am I am a part of a democracy, and I do believe that you know deep down, if you give people enough information, and you give them the resources, a person is best suited to making a decision on their own. Right. And whether it's how they are to what what goes into them, or how they're how are they to to work with their family, you know, with the decisions they did in 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 either being in a family, and how decisions are made with that family or their business, or their property, and deep down it's hey, you guys are best, you the people are best suited and smart enough to know what's best for you. And, you know, hopefully we can give you the resources, we can give you the, the, the information so that once you make your decision, it's there. I want to get a vaccine or uh, I want a test kit or a pulsometer or whatever. <clears throat> the irony. And, and I think that's the difference here. Yeah, and the, that's what I'm concerned. The irony if, is... If it was the Roman Empire or the Chinese Empire or if it was the Soviet Union, uh, an authoritarian state, um, then no, it's the, it's the emperor. It's the czar. Right. Uh, it's uh, the the great leader, like like Kim Jong Un or grand leader. That hey, uh, I'm Big Papa. You guys, you need me. You, you're you're stupid. Let me help you. I don't want you to die. I hate to be I'm rude the about it. No law, right? But you know, uh, um, uh, I don't prescribe to that in, in a democracy. Um, and you know what 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 it means. Uh, then, you know. Shouldn't the people be the bosses? And shouldn't they ultimately be the ones to make a decision? And I really, it's come about because of this pandemic where you've seen differing ways of how to, to the, the people in positions of power move forward. It kind of hinted at the state of society too, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because the irony is that you mentioned all this information can be given to the people by the government, but all this information is readily available yeah. on the internet. I wish you so, were true. The problem is too. I've is, seen. You no, know, uh, I hate to say it. It's, things have changed. And remember, they haven't regulated. I don't. I, you know, it's a scary thing because it is all private sector, so you don't want to see regulated, particularly big tech. But I've seen biasness in big tech. Yeah, yeah. And so, that's that's my other point that I was headed to. Right, it's like hard to filter 
you know well, the what's, censorship what so, what uh what the internet is telling you and and what is real and what is not real right? i go back to anyone in the beginning of this thing that questioned the efficacy of the vaccines that they that they that they you know what was being represented by the government by authorities um or that you know not that wearing a mask or not wearing a mask is uh is uh you know masks are it's more of a detriment especially for kids it's more of a detriment than a, 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 a deterrence against COVID. Those things were actually anyone who came up with something like that, of any type of, uh, they were being they were being exed out, canceled, and uh, there would be fact checkers. Uh, and yet, as things have evolved, some of those things actually, you know, you, you um, those statements that that were once considered fake science or or you know uh, incorrect fact they're, checkers they're all of a sudden they're all of a sudden true. correct yeah and but but what about over these past two years when when people were trying to get information somehow those fact checkers that were in big tech whether it was google or yahoo or twitter or facebook whoever whatever made them decide to to, to negate an opinion has in turn as it turns out it was incorrect so everything I go back to providing information to people. The scary thing now is because of the reliance on the internet and on social media, there's still those folks that control the content of social media. And again, they believe, again, I go back to big daddy and big mama. Mm -hmm. They believe we're not smart enough to get all this information, both left and right, both pro and con and make decisions based on it by research. And then they're starting to censure or complete. One thing is censoring and saying you're wrong. But the other thing is just to eliminate like it doesn't exist. And unfortunately, that's some of the stuff I'm seeing in big tech. So it's crazy because right now, you know, they can do it. Yeah, there is true evidence of, you know, the Internet being wiped, right, and mm -hmm. cleaned up and especially uh, things that maybe Facebook doesn't want you to see, right, the more – the more uh, grotesque uh, items that are that are posted on the internet, right, yeah. or posted on Facebook, they go and wipe it. What goes What goes about stuff? Who's maybe a big pharma guy who's is, yeah. is giving them some money and being able to kind of cater the the message, yeah. right? And well, it's not something that's that's only for the, that that was only caused by the internet. That's been happening for a long time, right? Yeah, for a long time, science. Uh, I was watching a documentary and saying that uh, these big companies who would use research and studies in order to uh, uh, combat other opposing views, mm -hmm. they would they would pay for thousands and thousands and thousands of, or maybe thousands and thousands is too much, but hundreds of studies to happen to sort of saturate. Mm -hmm the real studies so that you kind of get lost in what is really in, in what is what is the actual truth and what is paid for yeah. by these big companies that want you to believe that maybe sugar well, isn't bad or trans fat right yeah money okay you, you're going into you, you, how everything is sometimes tied to money and all these big corporations you know they have to deal with you know publicly held companies uh, of course, these public held companies and the top of them have these geniuses that are multi-billionaires that, you know, either that was the brainchild that this company was set up or um, uh, or they are in control uh, of this new company. And, uh, but bottom line is they got to, you know, they got to keep their, their shares up. That means they have a certain profit, but, you know, you have to look at the bottom line every year. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, that's tough in this modern day. You have to look at, quarter, you know, not oh God, their earnings on a quarterly basis. So... They got to make sure that you know their company is profitable, right. including the purveyors of information or the or the or the or those that manufacture new types of medicines. And so there's this constant pressure. Everyone wants to do the right thing, but you also got to look at the money and where it flows and who and where the money is accumulated, and understand that there's a there's motives that are not also always altruistic in a capitalist society. Um, and, and, and you see, you know, where, where, um, um, you know, potentially where, how decisions can be made. You know, it's interesting. A lot of these doctors, including Dr. Fauci, uh, I don't know if this podcast, can podcast be censored as well? Uh, you because, know, uh, one of the top podcasters in the world. Joe Rogan. 
he's being he's being canceled well, at the moment you know, you know due to the people that he's brought on but you know i mean that's just well he, he, the he's there are, there's obviously an attack on him sure. and people trying to shut up his platform yeah, remember, but you cannot you cannot stop a platform of someone who's built something for the yeah. last 10 remember to 12 the guy years, that right? created the vaccine uh, what's his name dr robert malone malone so even him from the beginning now he's been ostracized because he said hey you know right. i know what this thing is kicked off twitter yeah right. and but 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 he said you know kind of like what he was always saying this thing is not a guarantee it it you know it's it's so focused that you know the, every variant is going to be different so you know don't put all your eggs on this he i mean he was but he's been he's been um vilified right and and you know of course he didn't have a monetary stake on this but no no offense to dr fauci but and some of these other doctors that are also working in NIH, which is semi-government, semi-private, some of these institutions, such are great universities, but there were laws passed decades ago. You know, I, I remember these laws sounded good, but remember originally with patents, if you were to use public funds, and that includes a lot of these research uh, grants out of uh, universities, for all these inventions, they, the, the, the patent would go to the university or to the government. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in all wisdom, you know, they wanted to, to breed a more, I guess, in, ingenuity. But then it was became that, no, the, 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 the research scientists and doctors, if they found something, even though they use public money or a public institution, such as, uh, you know, MIT or, or, or a, 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 a education institution that uses federal or public funding or tax monies, uh, then, hey, you, even though it's all money, public money or public or government, um, if you found it with your research team, you can patent it. So you've seen a bunch of these doctors uh, and professors uh, that and institutions of, of higher learning uh, where these patents occur and they get the patents. That also means they get the royalties. Mm -hmm. so, so once that thing happened, there was innovation. And with that innovation, we've had great, advances but then at the same time you know there there's doctor who and professor who and and joe and and but when they start looking at at what potentially you know to ensure that they have butter in their they butter their bread and they have dinner for available for their families and a nice house to live in there's a profit potential on it and i'm not trying to say to do, you know disparage any one of them but there's a there is a monetary side of it and so that's why I've always wondered why, you know, some of these guys uh, and ladies that, that, that are, you always have to wonder when someone does a counter theory and they really get personal. What's a counter theory is, you know, and if you look at some of the folks that weren't going on the, what was supposedly the science, they were vilified this past two and a half years. These guys are, they weren't following the narrative. They weren't following the, the narrative and it was so vicious mm -hmm. and they were being canceled people that really had good reputations before it's literally happening yeah. as Gosh, we speak poor Ivermectin, yeah. which was well, you know i think the guy that i think they got you got a prize what is that a nobel no, prize or right. something mm -hmm. and it's and it saved a lot of people from uh, from all kinds of intestinal diseases in you know in a lot of these third world nations right. saved millions of people all of a sudden it became cow medicine i mean right. it was crazy right. and and so you, you wonder why, you know, there's there's so much vitriol if it goes against the narrative. And I, I, some of it, I think, is, um, you know, um, some of these folks, you're going against what I, I, I'm, you know, I believe is right. And I'm the decision maker. And I'm in charge of this lab. And I'm the, uh, I'm the head medical director for the government of the United States. And by the way, I also make a little money on this stuff. So, you know, it, 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 it's, they're vilified. And unfortunately, I've seen this. Up so much in, in, in terms of established media mm -hmm. uh, and government entities where all some of these scientists and researchers have a vested interest in, in some of the money that are also vilifying those with, with, with different voices. That's scary because it just, you know, I hate to say it, if people are less than saintly uh, and once you have, you know, uh, the, the weakness of, of hum the human weaknesses, uh, you know, they may go too far. And and once you start censoring this or that, you know, you don't have to go too far back into whether it was the book burnings in Nazi Germany uh, or the pogroms of Russia, uh, where where um, any type of dissent or, or because someone was different individually and around their belief, uh, and whether it was in a science or in a religion, 
how uh, and and if they published something, you know, not only were the books were burned, but these people were uh, were also canceled. Right. And and uh, unfortunately, a bunch of these woke people who seem to be anti-fascist, they they don't read history books, and they seem to be of uh, unfortunately uh, of the same position as some of the fascists back in the 30s mm-hmm. and the beginning of the 20th century and before. Right. <clears throat> um, I hope, hope I'm pissing off some of these woke people, woke <laughs> people now, because I think some of you woke people have been in deep slumber for a long time. I definitely am not woke. So. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Do, do you think um, uh, local media has played a role in how our society on Guam uh, has reacted to COVID and how it continues to react to COVID? You know, the media sometimes always goes on um, on what they see is um, a conflict. Remember, me as a governor was different. The media always, they went for something because you had a Republican governor mm-hmm. and you had a, Repub- a Democratic legislature. So I so much as had flatulence uh, the, uh, or said something uh, <laughs> Okay, you know, you know me now. I'm the type of guy that makes statements, <laughs> but but you know, there there would be a lot of uh, 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 exclamations points points being put up by the the legislature mm-hmm. on on things I said or decisions I made. You were click and, you were clickbait, right? Uh, yeah, For man. Sure. You know, it was it was <laughs> so there was so much drama and tension between the executive and legislative branch that the media fell on it and they saw this and you know. I make a statement or mm-hmm. I do something and there's someone from the uh, the opposition party in the legislature who happened to be the majority saying something completely different. And so you had the media say, ah, and they, and they, I, I, I don't want to say played on it, but it was good. Right. There was these differences. So they brought it out. And when the media brought it out, it, like it was exploited it in yeah, a sense, and, but they brought it out, but then it was for public opinion and based on as things were revealed where they would go. If you noticed, you know, there's exceptions by, by some of the minority in Guam, uh, uh, and whether it's in the minority party or in the uh, a minority of the, of the Democratic majority or some folks that are in, in positions of, of, my, of minority staff, even like doctors in the community that didn't go along with the narrative, but they're, they're, they're so quiet that the media hasn't seen it. You know, un- unfortunately... The majority of the legislature has has you know basically been in lockstep with decisions made by a democratic governor, mm-hmm. and because of that, you don't see this tension. And I don't whether I don't want to call it laziness, or maybe they just believe the narrative, but it's made it a little bit more difficult for those you know you know, really when you have a news cycle, and you're busy as a reporter or as a talk show host, you may not have the time to do all this research. So because there is no opposite opposition to decisions being made, everything seems to be um, kind of going with the flow. Going with the flow. Yeah. And they're going with the flow. So I just don't see the type of, um, you know, that, you know the what has been going on and whether it's on talk show hosts. Like a media the influence. News, in, the media has not sense. been questioning enough. And on things like I said, so much of that has changed. It's not that it's not happening. It's not enough as yeah, to potentially... A, yeah create a public opinion yeah. right heck if you're listening to these doctors we need now uh, you know we're going to go fourth booster then five booster <laughs> and you're gosh you, you got to go you know poor cnmi they're at 101 percent vaccination rate <laughs> and they're having an explosion <laughs> I, I i we're laughing about it right, but right, right. you know they were the ones i mean there's us guam that has a high vaccination rate <laughs> and then cnmi <laughs> Where they're vac- they, they they really they, their vaccination rates 100 percent and or 101 percent I don't know how that happened, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and then the they, they followed all the rules, and they've really been much more organized how they got things done. But there's an explosion, right? So you know, um, now because folks aren't, you know, the the other side of things that maybe vaccines aren't that efficacy, maybe you know, mankind is, you know, um, not that smart. And every time it changes, you know, these things aren't going to, you know, ain't going to stop it. Right. Um, you know, maybe we've had very little confidence in natural immunity and thinking God and the human body are not smart enough if you're able-bodied and to take it and then get stronger by natural immunity process. Mm-hmm. So there's been this narrative. And uh, with that narrative, um, you know, we are where we're at. 
And, you know, there are some folks that are probably like what's happening in the United States. I'd be like, hey, okay, enough is enough. You know, we can't have the doctor running our lives forever. Right. And, okay, uh, governor or mayor or president, maybe we better listen to some of the folks in psychology that may say, hey, this may be causing some, you know, innate issues regarding our mental health, uh, particularly with kids. Maybe better listen to some of these folks um, that deal with uh, um, um, the economy and societal ills, and and you know, um, you know, maybe this 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 lockdown, this shutdown, uh, is bad for their businesses, bad for the social economic status of families. Um, you know, maybe we better take a look at you know some of these other you know folks that are hey, we focus so much on this 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 shutdown. You know, and and we, for a while we weren't even allowing for elective stuff, and you know the elective stuff. You know, cancer treatment is considered elective. Mm-hmm. A- anything other than you're getting a heart operation while you're getting a heart attack is an emer. But you know, that's an emergency. But anything else uh, is not an emergency, and so people not de- deferring some of their heart, uh, op- you know, operations. You know, maybe sometimes when you look at the whole thing. It comes to a point where maybe the doctor shouldn't be running the whole community yeah. and his advice. Maybe we got to take other aspects and when decisions are made by decision makers, it's a more balanced approach by a, a larger segment of the society. And also, you know, knowing full well, I go back to the, the main thrust of it. Hey, um, we are a democracy and, you know, uh, maybe we should let some of these decisions <laughs> be made by you know, our constituency, the people that voted for us. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, it gets... It Does gets, that seem so complicated? No, it doesn't. Uh, it, and it gets confusing mm-hmm. when you have doctors who, like, stood by their word, right, and and started implementing these things such as, you know, the car score, and then and then, and then they step down and someone else takes over and someone you know, else says it doesn't matter, that thing doesn't matter that they were doing, so we're going to go off of this, and then we're going to say, you know what, we should bring it back for a little bit and see what happens, and then we're going to say, you know what, this thing doesn't yeah, really hey, matter. And, and by the way, I'm not trying to be too rough on the Pobletskis and Dr. Davids of this world and the Dr. Fauci's. But they have the focus. They're in healthcare. They're the epi- epidemiologists. So, if it were up to a doctor, they want to see zero infection, zero uh, uh, fatality, um, and so, you know, they don't look at the perspective of the social economic issues, uh, of issues. Uh, you know, again, maybe not, uh, and also the psychological issues. Um, um, you know, those are things that maybe. You, you more see from experts from mental health and behavioral wellness or, or from the Chamber of Commerce or from, you know, um, um, from some of the churches, you know, mm-hmm. and, and peoples that want to get gather for, for, you know, for worship. So, you know, it's a different, they, that's not their job and that's no role. So I'm not trying to go too hard on him. He's just that maybe, you know, there, there comes a point where you take this advice and in a complicated society with hundreds of thousands or millions of people, there's other perspective, um, and you got to look at that. I mean, you know, if, if heck, by these rules, when I was governor, we do know, I remember that was when we were getting uh, millions of tourists. Mm-hmm. So we always got, you know, I always wondered, why in December through February, with the best weather in Guam, we're not having rain, we're, not, we're having dry, less humidity, the temperature's in the mid-70s, mm-hmm. why do we have so much flu? Well, it was because bunch of Korean and Japanese tourists were coming to Guam and they had terrible weather and they were bringing the flu here. <laughs> so we would have, I remember the PDN would put, this is the 50th day where Guam Memorial Hospital emergency room is packed. Run out of beds. All rooms. Right. People are in the hallways and all of them got the flu and a lot of them got pneumonia and people are dying. And there was a lot of people dying of pneumonia when I was governor and it started with flu. Most of them, a lot of them were, you know, and even with the DOAs, these were people for low income in the low income strata. They were from a very um, living in, in environments such as Gilbaza, Gilbreeze, where they had substandard housing. Mm-hmm. So they didn't have, they weren't access, ha, didn't have access to a doctor on a regular basis. They were living in areas where, you know, water and power were very iffy. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the conditions, you know, led to, you know, and also <clears throat> some of the unhealthy lifestyles of some of our people. 
Right. You know, we have hypertension, we have the you know the diabetes, and we got um alcoholism, all that, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But if you know in those times, uh, then if we were to base in how we're doing it now, then I we shut we should every flu season back then, because our you know we didn't have enough whole hospital beds. Well, then we should shut down uh, the whole island and don't allow tourists coming in, uh, and um, uh, people stay in their homes and you know that's what the pandemic thing you and, know and yeah and I'm saying it, thought would have been it right. was happening every year in Guam, hmm. but you know it, that if and I'm probably sure that if you talk to the epidemiologists for you know they probably would have said the same thing hey let's shut everything down now you know obviously maybe we shouldn't have brought the three, the, the hundreds of thousands of Koreans and Japanese with the flu in, into Guam. But there would have been an impact, and maybe we would have our flu season wouldn't have been as bad, and a lot of people wouldn't have been getting pneumonia going to the emergency room, and, and a lot of people wouldn't be dying of pneumonia because of this flu. Uh, but you know, we would have twelve thousand, ten to twelve thousand unemployed workers at Tumon Bay mm-hmm. uh, because we shut the tourists down, and you know, then we'd have some other issues that were more social economic, and in, in, in you know, and so you know that's why. Um, you know, um, you know, maybe like I said, some people are saying this is gonna. You know, even the experts are saying this may be endemic. So if it's endemic like the flu, there is gonna be a flu season, and there is gonna be a a, a season of um, a COVID season. Of COVID. I mean, you know what? <clears throat> Have you noticed now there are more people that are vaccinated than unvaccinated in the hospital, and lately there's mm-hmm. been more vaccinated people dying than unvaccinated people. So, you know, this whole thing about segregation, uh, maybe we should cool it with that segregation. Right. Start looking what's the underlying health issue. That's the one common thing. Aside from being a little bit uh, mononcle, underlying health issues. Right. Go back to my it sister takes, who's a very takes, healthy. Yeah. It takes four comorbid- comorbidities to 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 be affected by COVID. Yeah. And, and so maybe, you know, that's been an issue in Guam. Mm-hmm. Aside from the short term, we have all these hundreds of millions of dollars you know, spend it to improve our health facilities, such as the hospital, such as public health clinics, et cetera, um, and more access to, to at-risk people. But then at the same time, the long-term uh, uh, issue, underlying health issues, diet, exercise. Right. Mm-hmm. So we don't have a high percentage of our po- uh, population. Something, something that hasn't been yeah. pushed, As I'm saying right? this, I got my whiskey here and you got my, <laughs> and you got nachos chips. <laughs> But you know, as I as I as I cho- but I, but I am not no I'm, I am low risk. Right. I'm sixty, but I don't have hypertension, I don't have asthma, I don't have di- diabetes, uh, and you know so you know even at sixty I'm a uncle, but you know I'm not a high risk individual. Right. You know, and I I actually just went to go get a physical mm-hmm. last month. Yeah, you know, and I, I think I think it's gonna be, it should be a yearly thing for everyone, mm-hmm. and I understand that. Possibly not everyone can get a physical, but mm-hmm. it might be the best bet to, you know, I think to so. ensure that you are healthy enough to be able to combat whatever's coming your way. Yeah. I mean, I've had flus where I felt like I was on death door, right? Just hoping for someone to come and save me or or, or rid me of yeah. my demise. You know, it's like, oh. I mean, interesting you said that. I know someone, a family member, who was just recently came from a trip, and this person, um, um, because they were going the trip, not only were they vaccinated, but they got their booster. And then yet, on their way back to Guam, they were negative. When you know when they got that test before they left on the trip to Guam, because you have to have that negative testing. But when they arrived back in Guam, they tested positive. So an interesting, this person said they had the worst flu. It's like the worst flu they've ever had. Yet this person had been vaccinated twice and had the booster and had it recently. So, you know, I, I go back to some of the statements being made that, hey, you get this stuff and you get that. No, uh, you can't beat Mother Nature sometimes. Right. <clears throat> so that's where I go back to, um, you know, but also this person, you know, is, is an able-bodied person. They then go to the hospital and, they, and obviously, you know, there's no fatality. Uh, but that person got a really nasty, uh, uh, you know, had that, that COVID hit him, hit hit that person. But they did everything that they were supposed to do. Yeah. So we got to, you know, understanding that, you know, and like I said, now if, you know, what they're going to say, take a fourth booster, a fifth booster, you know, six. I mean, 
Yeah, it's ridiculous at that point. Right? I go back to natural immunity. Yeah. You yeah. know my son, Eddie. Yeah, I do. Eddie is interesting. I hope I don't get him in trouble. Eddie was, when the, when the, um, when the, when the virus hit Guam, he got it. He was the first one in our family to get it. Right. He got I it. was with him. Remember? Yeah. He hit him hard. Yeah. He's able-bodied, but he got over it. Yeah. But since he got it, there's been several, str- you know, just last year, all the rest of the family got mm-hmm. it. The only one that didn't get it was my son. Right. And it was interesting because I was vaccinated, and this was in 2021, so I got my la- second vaccination in April of 21. And then, of course, we had a family wedding in mm-hmm. August. Mm-hmm. And that's when I got COVID. Right. Eddie Boy was in that same wedding. He had gotten COVID the year before. Right. Exactly a year before. Before, like in, right. in I don't know, was it, what, what month was that? Uh, it was August. In right. August. Because I was, I was with him. I was actually, <laughs> I was actually with him in that, in that, it, during that time. And, you know, it makes no sense because yeah. I didn't catch COVID. And, and I feel like I, I, I haven't caught covid since and in january of 2020 that was the sickest i've ever been in my whole life and you know i mean it it, maybe it makes sense that well i had some antibodies and maybe i did have covid before antibodies that's why my son so my son who took a year without getting the vaccine he didn't take the vaccine Mm -hmm. but the natural antibodies of getting the original covid were stronger than my antibodies i got from taking the vaccine when it had only been four months, it, May, June, July, four months. Which it still should took, still be okay, so, right? If, yeah, and, and I go back to, to the natural. So my, I think my son got another COVID. No, he finally got COVID recently. I think maybe, or did he? I don't did know. he? I don't know. Maybe I don't, not. No, no, no. He still hasn't gotten so. it yet. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't but think so. But it goes back to the, um, some of the studies that have been shown. And these are all the numbers given. Obviously, you know, in this study, they're saying, who are the ones most likely to get COVID now? What do you think? It's um, the elderly. I no, would but think. in terms of of, of uh, being vaccinated and have got and have gotten COVID before or not gotten it. Uh, I believe the vaccinated are most likely to get COVID rather than those who have already gotten COVID. Well, there, there, let me get the, and I'll go from one polarity one side to the other. The ones most likely to get COVID are those that are unvaccinated but who have not gotten COVID before. Okay, because they're virgin territory, right? Right. The ones least likely to get COVID now are those that were unvaccinated but who had gotten COVID. Even more, they are more hardy than someone who has been vaccinated like me who has gotten COVID. And it is, you know, I don't, this, this, this thing, I didn't need to get this study. I, I knew it just from our family because already I'm a guy that was vaccinated and I got COVID. I got a son was unvaccinated and got COVID, and he and he's he's uh, resisted. So I go back to the issue on natural immunity. If you are, by, by the way, I'm concerned about all these now trying to force kids to get vaccinated. Yeah, um, I that, think Pfizer just oh. they just they just delayed their uh, zero uh, six months to five years yeah. uh, vaccination approval, and Kid, uh, that's are, something I'm very against, though. You know, kids by their very nature, because at their age, except for if they have underlying health issues, most kids, when you see them, the rapid growth, the, the, you know, they're, they're young, they're strong. Mm-hmm. That's why, you know, having being a kid of eight, one of eight brothers and sisters and me having six, six kids, kids are a Petri dish. Whenever they go to, you know, that's why school starts, they're always catching something, but they always get over it. They have natural immunity, just get strong. So with kids, if they're, you know, this, you know, natural immunity, if there's one part of the human uh, condition where you're most strongest and able to hit, get something afflicted with something and get over it is those that are, are young. Uh, you know, the, those folks that are, you know, like the five to 12, the five, you know, the young ones. Right. Um, so, you know, it's kind of like almost chicken pox. Sometimes a lot of people wish to get their kids a chicken pox because they get it, they get it. And they're, that's it. So I'm seeing this push now for getting all kids vaccinated. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. You know, can we kind of slow down now? We're even saying the Omicron is one that it seems to be more mild. Mm -hmm. It's very transmissionable. Like I said, even if you get a vaccine, you're going to get it and you're going to transmit it. Mm -hmm. If you are in 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 a certain demographic where you are the one that's most likely 
to fight it off uh, like a kid. And I go back to these statistics and show, hey, if you have been gotten it and you're unvaccinated, you're the most hardy. Doesn't normal logic say that? Eh, maybe you should just get it. If you get it, you don't want to force it on somebody, but don't don't rush to get a vaccine. Yet all these folks in the narrative now is you should get the vac now that the now that the doctors have said it and CDC has said it, um, you should have your kids vaccinated. Yeah, and it, it goes I back. I don't know about that. It goes back to the problem that we were discussing earlier: is that one size fits all yeah. problem, right? Something that they've been pushing since mm-hmm. the beginning of the pandemic, right? Yeah. And um, by the way, I'm going to caveat on that. I'm not going to hold it against pa- pa- parents believe that their kids should get vaccinated. Fine, right? That's I think every parent has that right. Give them all the information. You never know. You know, obesity, kids, childhood diabetes. Mm-hmm. There's risks, right? But once a government entity or uh, uh, someone in charge of a school starts saying, no, your kids have to all be vaccinated. That's where I think we're drawing, you know, that's where I go back to let, let people make decisions on themselves and their families. Don't force it on them. And I'm hopeful we never get to that point. It, you know, it feels like we're, we're walking the fine line, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Of that. And, you know, gladly, you know, we're starting to see European countries starting yeah. to open their eyes and say, hey, you know what? This ain't as bad as we thought it's going to be. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, all restrictions and all requirements, they're all going to go away. And you're saying yeah. European country, one by one by one and by one. Have you noticed one. in Guam, other than maybe podcasts like this, the narrative have been pretty steady here in Guam. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I've seen because of this Omicron explosion, I'm driving on the road and I'll be looking at cars right next to me. And I'll see a single person in a car. The windows all rolled up. They got air con and they got a mask on. Mm -hmm. And I feel for these people because, you know, if you really start looking at all the modern science and stuff, these folks, they're probably, when it comes to hypertension, when it comes to stress, if you are in your car all by yourself and you got your mask on, you are, you know, there, there, there is the narrative of man. And I, by the way, I understand them because if, if you follow the narrative that you got to get vaccinated and you got to do all this and that, and you can't do this and that. And yet you're seeing daily in the, in the news, the statistics of the vaccinated and unvaccinated people going to the hospital. And you're seeing on a daily basis, the vaccinated, unvaccinated dying. Then you're, you, you could panic. You're right. saying, where are they? All of a sudden, a paranoia. everything that's, you know, you, you, what you, you, there's this confusion. So I'm seeing a lot of people in Guam, and again, more than I saw earlier, where this, where I, I'm, I'm seeing that, oh my God, you know, um, they're freaking out. Yeah, yeah. And that's where, you know, gosh, I sure hope. You know, look at the lines um, for the last month over at testing sites, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you know, there was a fear that, that there was cases, right? And, and then people, all of a sudden, they want to go. The lines all the way down teeth and people want to get tested. Yeah. And of course, of course the numbers are going to go up when more people are getting tested. Yeah. Right. And maybe that's what, maybe that's what the narrative wanted, right. Yeah. To get people tested so that there's more of a reason why to push the narrative. Yeah. Right. But, you know, I mean, if we just continue to live the way we're living, then there's no reason to be afraid. Yeah. Right. You know, what's freaking me out too. Each one has a different, you know, the United States has never been really socialist, but some of these, you know, the, you know, Northern Europe, Europe has, there's been more experiments in socialist form of government, not communist, but, you know, vanilla communist. Oh, right, right, like so uh, you start, when, Finland, when Sweden you, when you start type places. At Finland and the Swedens, these are, <laughs> these have always been more socialistic. Yet some of these states are, they've actually, who are more akin to government, you know, more in a part of your lives. They're the ones that are throwing away all these mandates and saying, okay, enough's enough. <laughs> yeah. So you know I'm like, you well, know, guys, we were wrong. <laughs> have you noticed all the Nordic, all the Nordic states yeah. are, uh, are throwing it away. Yeah. 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 So mm-hmm. it's, yeah. I mean, and the, you know, a lot of them too. I think even Boris Johnson, he, yeah. he decided to join them, you know? Well, and, and you know, it's interesting because they all were, you know, the United States is the world leader. So obviously the ones that started this were China. So they, you know, China, but China's an authoritarian state. So they, they did their shutdowns. They'll close a city of 10 million people down and mm-hmm. shut them down. Right. But that's an authoritarian state. But then when the United States 
when they got it, you know, you're starting to see all, like I said, the, the very, you know, the, these real, these real restrictions in civil liberty. So when they were seeing it in the States, you know, a lot of the West follows what America does. So these, all these countries started following along with America. And just like what you're seeing in America now where certain states, uh, their elected leaders and their governors would either say, okay, this is great. I will follow along. Or they say, nope, uh, we're going we're gonna to open up. But at the same time, you're seeing in, in these other, particularly in European states, where, you know, there's, uh, there's varying degrees of support or just like say, like you just mentioned with, uh, with Sweden and, and Norway, they're just like, nope, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. It's done guys. We're, it's we're... endemic. It's going to be like the flu. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, there, we're, we're, there's going to be another season, but yeah. you know, we cannot, we can't keep keeping you guys home. No. You know, it, it, it first hit me when I went stateside, um, last year in october mm -hmm. how much of what's happening here on guam mm -hmm. is it, it's almost like we're veiled as to what's happening throughout the rest of the united states right and maybe mm -hmm. it's the algorithms of the internet and maybe it's the people who control the internet who are making us see what we want to see what they want yeah. us to see right but until i went over there and physically actually well, I was in New Hampshire, you know, mm -hmm. live free or die, right? They're, yeah. they're live free or die. And we walked into a restaurant, you know, mm -hmm. no signing in, <laughs> no proof of vaccination, right? We just walked in, you know, no, no one's wearing masks, right? And so it, it's, it's as if they were living normally in a time where here, you know, I was just back home a, a couple of days ago and people are freaking out, right? And, and then it hit me. You were in the United Socialist Territory of Guam. <laughs> <laughs> I, it hit me. I've been texted. Yeah. I've been texted my friends, and I said, "Hey guys, mm -hmm. I've never, I've never felt so free mm -hmm. in the last year and a half mm -hmm. than I do at this very moment." Yeah. And I feel like I should text you guys yeah. to tell you guys what I'm feeling. I, I, it, it just came upon me that I mm -hmm. needed to let my friends know that, mm -hmm. hey guys, whatever's happening here mm -hmm. is is a bunch of. It might be baloney, you know. We yeah. have to. We, we, I mean, it, it, maybe I could be wrong, but we have to question it. Yeah. We have you to know, question the things that are happening. Especially because... something that comes from an all-powerful federal government. You know, it's interesting because as a governor, you know, I respect guys like Michael Bavakwan, Lola Leon Guerrero. You know, they're. I'm Chamorro. I'm pro self determination. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to see it. territory status is like you know, it's nothing. It's like we're in purgatory limbo. We either going to be a state or we're going to be uh, it's independent. a huge, huge gray yeah. area. Yeah. So I, I I go along with them, but. I've just noticed how, you know, some of these folks like Bavakwa or, or Melvin uh, uh, Wampat Borja, um, boy, these guys, you know, anytime the federal government said something, uh, you know, why are we following their mandates? But boy, they've been quiet. <laughs> I get, <laughs> I'm saying, wait a minute, what happened to our, these nationalists that are, I'm pro, hey, you're right. You know, I've even, I've always pissed off when I see all these mandates coming from the federal government. I always believed as governor, a lot of these federal mandates were actually hurting Guam. And, you know, they did this cookie-cutter approach to things, and Guam, in the end, was always getting screwed. Mm -hmm. Yet, some of their most, like, Bavakwa, uh, boy, when, when President Biden has said things and the federal government comes out with all these edicts, uh, I haven't heard them saying, hey, what about our local rights? Right. Why are, we didn't even vote for this president. Why are, why are we, you know, so... I don't know. Something funky here. Again, I think those guys are more on the left, but, you know, and that's just how it's been in Guam. We have some of our our nationalists are more in the woke crowd and the left of the left liberal progressive side. But you know, I've seen them also bend over uh, as federal mandates uh, were being implemented over here, uh, and um, um, you know, it's which is counter to what they were, well, you know, how they their approach was in in in, in previous years. So it's disappointing. Um, if, you know, if all, for all our nationalists here, uh, that, uh, uh, don't mind these infringement on our civil liberties and a lot of them coming, uh, as a result of our governor following the, uh, the mandates of the federal government, then, um, I don't know, you know, maybe they should, you know, rethink things, uh, and don't, you know, when the feds, when we come out of this, huh? when we come out of this, well, I'm just hoping they think about it. You know, if you really, if you, you know, if, if you really truly are, uh, into let's make decisions based on, on what we believe is best interest of ourselves, 
why do we keep so quiet when when so much of these edicts come out? I didn't hear them screaming when Biden made his you know his decision that all businesses, uh, what a hundred employees or more, uh, will, will have to get a vaccine for all their employees, or even like right now, you know, that are contracted to do business with the federal government. Right. You know, I didn't hear, oh man, you're infringing on our local businesses. Da 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 da. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> yeah, wake up, woke people. <laughs> You know, and, and, and unfortunately, we've had to watch our our economy suffer, mm-hmm. right? In all of this, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and and maybe maybe it, it would have suffered anyway because because Asian countries were shutting yeah. down and they weren't allowing people to travel, mm-hmm. right? But you know, why not? Why not even try to try to loosen things up to to make it. To make it to where now maybe we can have the local econ- the local people be able to flood to flood the economy with with whatever they're earning yeah right yeah. and and it, it was it was almost like a handcuff at that too yeah it's, we're in a weird time now it is it's right extremely now, you know, and, and um we've we've had two there's actually three things that have kind of driven our economy it's always been tourism mm-hmm. military investment a lot of the military spending here like and, and now it's in construction. But the construction industry as well for both civilian uh, and the military. Right now, we have a dead, dead uh, tourism services industry. Remember, I go back, employed 10,000 people or plus. And then if you add on the, the services that are tied to servicing the tourism industry, maybe 15,000 workers. Correct me if I'm wrong by 1,000 or more. But the other end of things, we've got... God, five hundred million to three, almost a billion dollars annually of military construction, mm-hmm. and we're having all these military exercises. So there's also reprovisioning and provisioning of all the military that are coming back and forth in Guam. So we're seeing that uh, that that happening in the military side, and then again, construction industry is booming on the military side. While on the civilian side, let's face it, it's been tough. We're having some, but it's still kind of tough. And what's so weird is now you also have what's what's kept Guam going, why we're not collapsed, we haven't collapsed, is this injection of federal monies right. that came as a result mm. of the pandemic. And it's like um it's like an adrenaline um um you know, high. Yeah. Because it's kept even though we have so many unemployed, so many the money was coming in that even unemployed people were getting compensated. You know, even if they're not working. Well, this is causing, you know, it's a very interesting time now for Guam because they have, you know, one, one pillar of our economy is just do- gone. And and yet, because of military, because of the military construction, and because of the, you know, the, the billions of dollars that were pumped in as a result of the pandemic, it's kept Guam afloat. Yeah, you're kind of seeing the but, true driver of the economy, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and you got to just look, Ford, obviously, the federal money is going to run out for the pandemic. Mm-hmm. Um, the one certainty thing is, and it's a matter of when, and then when it's running low, you know, who's am, who's impacted first? And, you know, then there'll be, the if, if you know, let's say we don't get any tourism industry moving for years. Well, the first ones that are going to suffer are those that aren't getting the unemployment uh, assistance or rent assistance. Uh, but then, you know, once you, you have all these people that aren't getting paid, then there's the other monies that are going to be running out, you know, that, that and some of them are for particularly government services or or government infrastructure or construction activity uh, that the government needs, you know, you know, like let's say they got $100 million for highways mm-hmm. construction from this most recent uh, federal legislation. So that, that stuff, better. it's all that money that's going to sooner or later run out. Or go back to a normal pace. Um, the military construction is going to continue to go up, but then there's that question mark on tourism services. Where is that going to be? Where is that going to be in six months? Where is that going to be here uh, in a year? And with that, you know, if we don't get it recovering in a pace, when do the wheels start falling off? Where right now there's hardship and there's just going to be more hardship yeah it's almost like um, um it's yeah. almost like disguised yeah. success right it's crazy everything and actually there's a like i said with adrenaline you know uh, you know remember when a person gets a heart attack they shoot them up with adrenaline right. remember that's good yeah. at the beginning keep them alive but then 
there's going to be a down for, for and hopefully when the when you know when the goes when the person goes down there's always the impacts of the artificial inducement of adrenaline what it caused that there's going to be an opposite reaction right and we're already feeling that when 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 the federal government starts printing all this money and started giving out all these programs you know you look 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 at the inflation right now Right. Well, it started out with you know the oil and the, and that affected trans uh, gas. By your gold, the transportation, yeah. Yeah. But then everything you know, right now because of all, there's a cause and effect. Okay, we've we've kept ourselves and you know Guam we we're not federal taxpayers, so it's not directly in our debt. But for federal taxpayers, it is. Right. But you pump you pump money and you keep printing it. There, there's a cost to that, and that cost is the lower value of the money. Of the dollar, yeah. And that's why, you know, inflation is just going crazy here. It started out with oil, um, and, and and that obviously affects transportation. It affects power because, you know, we all a lot of us rely on fossil fuels. Amazingly, food has gone yeah, up but over, everything. Yeah. Be, be, but, like, again, Lumber. It, you know, you don't have to be a sterling economist. You know, the more, a com- uh, more money that's printed, uh, the value of, uh, of 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 that currency goes down, mm-hmm. which means is, you know, what took uh, 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 two dollars at one time for a one product, it's going to be two fifty. Yeah, or three dollars. The value the value of the currency yeah. goes down, but the value of the commodity goes up. So all this dynamic, some of it and a lot of it is not within our control, yeah. is affecting Guam too. So you know, let, let's face it, you get everybody employed, but if these inflationary pressures start keep on going, boy, it's like. Well, you know, I if if the average cost of living in Guam goes up by a thousand a year for everybody, where, where are they going to have that makeup? You know, they're they're going to have to change their adjust their their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And what right now what's happening? That with, means the poverty line is also rising, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, obviously, because because you you have the cost of living, and that's going up. Inflation. That's a terror. This thing happened. You know, this happened decades ago when we had right. I remember the the late seventies, where you had like. You know, twenty one percent inflation rate, mm-hmm. but then you had twenty one percent interest too in the bank. I mean, and guess what's happening now? In order to, you know, if the Fed and the federal government is going to do something, so they keep talking about raising interest rates. So, that, you know, that's right now. Everyone can get a loan at a certain amount of thing, or even if you do have a loan, you know, if it's an arm, it's adjustable rate. Mm-hmm. That means if the cost of borrowing goes up you know and a lot of folks that have an arm loan boy that's scary yeah, yeah. because then the their co- monthly costs go up and, and you know the fed is caught kind of caught they don't have much things to to work with so everybody who, who's buying a car or buying a house or buying land all of a sudden the cost of borrowing gets more expensive they're trying to control the inflation but then you know, the short term, and you know, they, they have to, because you can't have this keep on spiraling. You don't want to be like South American countries of the 70s when their money became worthless. Mm-hmm. So what is going to happen? People now are going to have a tougher time with, with their, um, with, you know, the ability to buy a house or to buy a car because the loan is going to be that much more expensive. And if you have an existing arm loan, adjustable rate, right. ooh, you never know. So it's kind of a scary interesting dynamic time right yeah. because you can you can be fooled by the fact that interest rates are low but taking into consideration inflation you can be shooting yourself in the foot yeah. by saying this is the best time to buy and guess what the scary thing is can you imagine not only inflation occurring because there's going to be that time because i think they're just going to they have to adjust rates they got to slow down the, the money's too cheap now yeah so What's going to happen, not only for some folks and for, you know, the the regular Joe and Maria Cruz, not only is inflation going up, price of everything, but now their their, their debt goes up too. And so they're going to be paying higher interest rates. Right. It's a scary, scary combination. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't help that, you know, uh, I guess what's your thoughts on, you know, the 50, the 51,000 people who do not want to work. Right. Not only are they unemployed, but because they've been getting these subsidies I really over the de- last over the last like I want a couple I mean, years. That's, I want to see what de- that demographic is because I know probably a lot of people got this money, and for some people, it was more money than they've gotten their regular job. Mm-hmm. How much of it saved? 
And then, you know, they're going to have to decide, make a decision on their own. Okay, uh, this money's gone. So where do I go back to? When I get back to it, you know, is there going to be a job available to me? Then at the same time, I go back to that gentleman I saw. I see more of them. He's driving in a car with the windows closed and their masks on. There's so much fear. So, you know, when, when I, I, and that's why I really wish I, I, I could get a better understanding of all these people that aren't working. You know, how much of that is, well, because, you know, um, I'm comfortable. I've right. got enough money coming in from unemployment or wherever, my situation, that I don't need to work. How much of that is fear? Because, you know, they've bought into the narrative that, God darn it, I better shut everything down. I'm scared of everybody. And um, uh, I'm scared to breathe the air, <laughs> including in a car by myself. Yeah. So... You know, that, and I, I don't blame them. You know, I'm not trying to say, just I'm saying there's a lot of people that have been spooked by some of the stuff that's been coming out by, by the narrative. And it's scary. One thing, and you know, and that's why I go back to mental illness and tension and hypertension and depression. I don't know if anyone measured the suicides here. But right now, if there's one thing, everything in, everything in Guam has gone up. What's the one thing that's gone down dramatically in price? In price? Mm-hmm. Oh, what can I say? Crystal methamphetamine. Hmm. I've heard. When I was governor and we had the Mandania Drug Task Force, you know, I wish we could be more successful, but, you know, we were doing a lot of arrest and a lot of drugs, but the but the, the street, but the, ultimately you see what the, what, what's going on in, 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 in uh, interdiction by the price. We were between 500 and $600 a gram for crystal meth. Right now it's under, under 100 bucks. I was talking to some guys in the police force. Under a hundred dollars per gram for crystal meth, where it was That's three a or two hundred percent decrease in yeah. in cost. And, and you know, there's two things. Number one, there's a there's a lot of people. Obviously, there's a lot of supply mm-hmm. because you know the price has gone down, but there's probably a lot of demand. And then you're seeing a lot of people now, and it could be for whatever reasons. You know, I'm not there to decide, judge, other than there's a lot of people that decided to take the stuff. So we're having now the issues of drug addiction and with drug addiction, again, all the societal economic impacts of a bit, a growing percentage of our population on drugs. I don't know if you've noticed, but you know, gosh, there's a lot of people walking around in Guam. You go in a, and I, you know, I go shop, I'm, 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 I'm Joe Public now. Mm-hmm. So I go through the parking lots at a shopping center. I go, you know, even to our supermarkets. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And I, I see, you know, it's not, you know, so a lot of these folks that are homeless and panhandlers, uh, and you know, there's a great percentage of them that have substance abuse, sub- substance you know problems, and and when you had long term substance abuse problems, you got mental illness. You feel for people, but it's you know we're getting in this cycle here, and it's getting bigger. So can you imagine that what's happening in Guam now? There's just so much variables that are making it even more difficult. So you know people start feeling that stress. You know, hey, one one way to get rid of that stress is, is you know, the only thing that's going down in price is crystal meth. Right. <laughs> so yeah. they'll take a toke of crystal meth. Can't, can't afford bread, but, uh, yeah. you know, I'll go get a hit, right? Crazy, man. It is. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's almost, uh, how do you manage it, right? You know, but because society is sort of breaking down from this, it's it's kind of crumbling in all in all facets. Yeah, well, right. We're kind of like a microcosm of the United States. I don't believe we, you know. I, I you know you you've been in some cities. Like I said, the last time I was in the cities, you know, we're not like there. Mm-hmm. But you can see some of the trends that are occurring, in in in, in terms of um, you know again, issues of of homelessness, of drug addiction, mental illness. Um, and if we don't, you know, obviously, if you have a growing economy, uh, and think, by the way, things have changed. You know, when I was governor, we had 4% unemployment. Right. We, our problem was we didn't have enough workers. But, you know, that's, that's, that's a whole different time. That was pre-COVID. So now, you know, we've got, and that's why I said the decision makers now, they've got to, you know, because of the stage we're in right now, no offense to Dr. Pobleski and Dr. David and Dr. Fauci, but you got to look at this holistically. So you've got to look at the, the general population and look not only at the issue of COVID, but the general condition of society 
and how do we stabilize the issue so where people can can feel you know that there's hope and that as they move along in their lives uh, you know they, they that they that they can go in a certain direction there's resources available to make a better life for themselves uh, you know so you're saying it is reverse it can no, be of reversible. course it's reverse I, right now I do know one thing well first of all these mandates got to stop yeah they gotta you, know, go. you know, you ask my personal opinion. Hey, man, start focusing on the whole community. Right. And now uh, there's issues. Go grow the economy. Work towards work with the the travel <clears throat> bureaus of Korea and Japan and Taiwan. Uh, work with their governments. Uh, work with the local hotel industry. Not and the segregating DV. our society yeah, between stop. and simple things like segregation. Right. Stop treating the non-vaccinated like uh, they're they're pariahs. Right. So you know things like that. Um, at the same time, you know we got it. We got. The governor's got millions of dollars. Fortify our hospital. Fortify. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'd love to build a hospital right now, but before you build a hospital, maybe it's best to just work on some of the public health facilities and the hospital and the hospital facilities now. Um, work on and getting, you know, when it comes to the COVID, to the at-risk uh, uh, community here on, on ways to deal with COVID. Uh, um, then at the same time, I can go back to the tourism aspect. You got to work towards improving that criminal activity. The island is exploding in crime. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wish the, the gov didn't get rid of you know they they the first thing they did when they got in is they got rid of the Mandunya Drug Task Force, made people like Troy, Troy Torres and these druggies happy, <laughs> but you know it's not it, in the end you know um, you got all these folks that are in positions of power and influence and again even bloggers like Troy. But let's face it, you know, they're, they're, they're people that admittedly are on drugs or they're in the business of drugs. Um, well, we got we to gotta curtail the activity. Uh, there's too much drugs coming into Guam. We can't, we, we got to, um, you know, uh, we got to be tough. Heck, you know, for me, I was tough. We were, we, were, we were arresting people left and right. We were just trying to push the AG to get more convictions. But people going to jail, they do, if they do something wrong on drugs, we also have programs for, hey, um, here's, you know, we work with the contractors uh, for, for, my, uh, for, the, for the lady criminals. There was, uh, for those that are incarcerated, they had, a, a, you know, heavy equipment training for, so they could drive heavy equipment. We saw construction is going up. So you work on those people that, that are incarcerated, so that they have a better life, that they mm -hmm. have a second chance. Yeah. Um, obviously, strengthening the, the drug, you know, drug counseling. So that they can get out of drugs when they leave, um, but um, you know we we, we it's this thing with with the crime. Um, there's just too soft on it. You know our AGs focusing on on white collar crime. But I think they should force focus more on you know the criminals, mm, right? <laughs> actual actual the violent the violent crime that is occurring on Guam and mm. crimes against people. Uh, and a lot of it's focused on drugs. Yeah, when people's heads are getting cut off and oh, brought man. into different villages, right? Yeah, it, you know, the, the, people are feeling unsafe in Guam. And so we need to strengthen the police task force. Hey, if they don't like Mandunya Drug Task Force, change the name. <laughs> <laughs> huh? What do you want to have? The uh, Agupa Drug Task Force. Uh, I don't know. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. But they got to focus on, on, on criminal activity. Um, I'm, I'm seeing gangs. They they have so much money. They're buying up buildings, and businesses. They're even giving their colors. I mean, talk about blatant. Some of these businesses are black and red. It's like the criminal bosses in this island. Yeah, hey, I can say it because I'm a former governor. But they're basically saying, "Hey, yeah, we made our millions pe getting people on drugs. Now we're going to buy a restaurant. We're going to buy a bar. We're going to buy a building and buy a house and and screw all of you because we made it big. This is like the gangsters in the states." Right. You know, I hate to say it, they've glorified gangsterism and there's profit in gangsterism. So, you know, there's some, there's a sickness and we got to go after, you know, the criminals, but not just the low level criminals, but go after the big, big shots as well. Um, uh, be hard on crime. Um, and at the same time, um, for those criminals that go to, you know, go to prison, give them, give them a way out through, you know, vocations, training, um, and, uh, drug, uh, treatment. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that's one way you can do it, but you know, it's, yeah, it's, it, we have a long way to go. No offense. It, it, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, 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 feel like, I feel like we've taken five steps back yeah. from any progress that yeah. has been made. Right. And, you know, yeah, yeah, we can attribute to COVID, but you know, there had to been some decisions to have been made 
to help, like you said, curtail some of the things that are happening today, mm-hmm. right? And everything, everything is an effect, right? Mm-hmm. It's a causal effect. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's better we start now than mm-hmm. wait till you know the federal government says it's okay, mm-hmm. right? And what's what's stopping us from making those kind of decisions, right? Could it be federal funds mm-hmm. not coming in anymore? Yeah, to maybe support people uh you know people not continuing yeah. to work right and it's it's I proven think to be there's got to be an urgency by the way by by leaders and it means a collaboration everybody meeting of minds both in the government private sector some of our community leaders uh because we're going to get root you know like i said the money's going to dry up right it's and then go away. and then that artificial high the adrenaline is going to be gone and it's important you know we we're, we're, we that we 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 have a way out of it or, you know, everybody in this community is going to get a cold slap in the face of reality. And, you know, that's what I'm concerned about. Now, we have an interesting, we have an election coming up. Right. So, you know, hopefully, you know, some of our elected leaders see that, hey, people are going to have to, you know, make a decision on certain things. So some of these folks better stop reacting to things and start getting proactive 100%, yeah. uh, in, and again, bringing the community in uh, so that we, you know, we can work towards getting our way through through it but as much as it sounds bad no no the good things are going to happen once this co- we're going to get through the covid guam was at 1.6 going 1.6 million tour 1.6 to 1.7 million tours before the covid guam is going to bring back the tour it, they'll be back it's a matter of when um there's going to be this heightened construction activity at least with the military um so we got to do that but, but at the same time we got to make sure that I mean, it's such, such things like with the governor working with, you know, the federal government on H, the H-2B program because we got we to gotta make sure that, you know, if, you know, that people can still be able to afford to buy a house and build a house or, you know, to, to buy land. But, you know, because of the, co- uh, no, or to construction, so, you know, construct something. So, you know, with the cost of construction right now, it's just way out of bounds, <clears throat> particularly you, with these labor issues. <clears throat> do you think that, you know, the skilled labor would go up, you know, it has a potential to go up on Guam without having to rely on H2B. It's already going up. You know what? It was interesting because they were, you know, even when the feds cut off, took out, kicked out all the H2B, I, I remember looking at that analysis on that. We had about, you know, um, of, of, of Guam citizenry, we had local construction workers. These were locals. Uh, of about close to 5,000 work construction workers and based on four to five to 5,000. So that accounts to about 9% of our work. This was back when I was governor, 9% of our workforce. So when this guy from the federal government said, why can't you be like Hawaii, you know, get more of your local people. So we did our study and it it was uh, in Hawaii, 5% of their workforce were in construction industry. And I go back to we were nine percent. So, mm-hmm. when you look at even our local workforce in the construction industry, we were nearly almost double of what the construction workforce was in Hawaii. Mm. So, yeah, we can continue. You know, that's why we're working with the Guam Trades Academy, Guam, uh, um, the uh, Guam Community College. That's why we have these programs for inter. Uh, you know, they can get tax credits for um, vocational training. Mm-hmm. So, if you're a plumber, electrician. Uh, a mason, you know, mason uh, or a woodworking carpenter, if the company uh, has teaches, you know, hires you as a local, uh, and the co- the cost of, of of educating you, they can get a tax credit on it. So we have that program, and we we are get constantly getting folks in our local workforce into the construction industry. But when you're talking about Guam, this community of 165,000. You're talking about a billion dollars a year on just military construction, not not even the civilian side of, of, of housing and, and hotel and apartment construction and retail construction. We just didn't have enough workers. And what and what when and that was you know, years back when we did have at least fifteen hundred H two B workers, we still were not enough. So we had we had forty five <clears> to five thousand the demand went we up. Had, we had, yeah, the demand in order to keep our growing economy. So we had about 4,500 to 5,000 local construction workers, and then we had 1,500 H2B. What did the feds do under Obama? They took them all out. 
So with all, and the military stuff was already growing and our local construction was going, um, all of a sudden we, we had 1,500 less workers. So now we have to beg our way to get him. And either, okay, it started, okay, only some, something directly with the, the really, uh, directly related with the military or associated with the military. So we're slowly getting them back. Now, most of them, I think we got much more uh, H2 workers now, but maybe, uh, and correct me, anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500 H2 workers now. But I think it's more than what they, we had when, when I was governor. Mm -hmm. But they're all in the military stuff. That doesn't help with some regular Joe and Maria Cruz trying to build a house or someone trying to build an apartment or someone trying to build a, you know, a commercial retail space and the cost of construction is going up. Now with all the stuff in inflation, also the cost of cement, rebar, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think um, someone was saying the cost of a, a Chinese worker today is about $300 a day, mm -hmm. $350 a day, mm -hmm. and it's gone up from about $100 a day um, well, they don't allow Chinese workers anymore. Those Chinese workers you're talking about local are, are, are probably green card holders hmm. or citizens. Okay. They don't, they, yeah. Right now for H2, since, and that even came when I was uh, governor, they, they switched away from any Chinese H2 workers. That's when we started getting more back from the Philippines. Right. So, but so. How did, how did Mexico so get involved? Mexico, just trying to find workers. And right. somehow one well, of the... Weren't we, weren't we getting H2 yeah. workers from Mexico? Yeah. We had a few from Mexico. I think they tried to get some from some of the islands, like Fiji. Um, but, you know, to a limited success. And, you know, again, when you're talking about the, the requirements uh, for the construction industry, both military and local, it's, you know, not enough. So I remember when when, when you know, even the most conservative numbers, when this military buildup is at full swing, which it's starting to, you're going to need four to five thousand H two workers plus the four thousand to five thousand local construction workers, which is what the requirements are. We're not even close to that yet. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, exciting times. But that's where <laughs> our local, you know, leadership got to get together, go talk to President Biden and uh, Mayorkas at Homeland Security, try to loosen things up there. And then again, working with uh, the other governments and the other private industries, uh, uh, businesses of Japan, Korea, and Taiwan to get more um, tourists in here. <clears throat> yeah, that'll be key, yeah. right? I mean, as, as and in the meantime, more Asians start to, Asian countries, sorry, not Asians, yeah. but Asian countries start to open up, right? Yeah. They should be more willing to, to travel this way. Yeah. Yeah. And then in the meantime, whatever millions of dollars we have from the federal government from this pandemic, they start looking where, where there's in business or industries that are near collapse uh, or people that are unemployed, uh, that you have certain programs available, you know, to keep this, the, 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 the this economy stable, uh, as we try to rebuild these industries. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, then again, very scary yeah. that yeah. 50, that 51,000 of the 53,000 unemployed mm. just do not want to work. Right. They yeah. just choose to. That's that's that so scary. Out. Yeah, that's that's freaky. That's freaky. It's not not that I cannot find a job. I just prefer not doing yeah. anything. Right. What do you think? I'm gonna ask you. What do you think? What maybe they had money before from the pua, but it's gone or, or it's about to be gone. What? How do you survive if you're not working? You know, um, it, sell I, drugs. I think. I think <laughs> Just sell it, crystal methamphetamine. It, it, it could be right. <laughs> uh, you know, the, it's you find a you find a you find a means to an end eventually, mm -hmm. right? And it, it could they could be the the case, right? And yeah, I don't I don't I don't I don't have a I really don't have a straight answer as yeah. to as to what would be the cause mm -hmm. for people not wanting to not wanting to work at all. Well, I think not. You know, I think things will change once. Like I said. When a person has to make a decision on not working or not working to support themselves, like say the money runs out, then they're going to have to, you know, make a decision to work. I would, I, and especially if there's if there's jobs out there. So, or we'll get would, more panhandlers. Or I well, well, and also maybe take the fear out. If if the issue is fear about going out into society into the general public, and that you know thinking that you you're going to die of COVID if you, if you go out. Unless Maybe. you're eating. Yeah. 
So, right. So, yeah. So there's got to be a dispelling of the fear, or, or, or <laughs> hey, it comes to the point where they're they may still be fearful of going out to work, but also their stomach is rumbling, and they need they need to work. Yeah. So you know, hopefully, government now can and the society can kind of calm down in the fear, and and show hey, folks, you know, maybe uh, what is that one president once said? There's nothing to fear but fear itself. <laughs> So, you know, stop being fearful. And, you know, we need you out there in the workforce. Go on, get a job. You know, hopefully. that might be the most encouraging thing, right? Yeah. Uh, for people to to get people motivated yeah. to do it, right? Yeah. Uh, I hope, it, by the way, I hope this is a great conversation. I hope I pissed off enough people. <laughs> Former governors, you know, we got, you, uh, I'm having a great time I, I, with your I'm chips, ha- I'm having with your a, whiskey. I'm, I'm having a great time too. Uh, we've hit the, we've hit the 145 mark. Oh my so, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It goes by quick. Well, let's do it again sometime. I, I'm, I'm always there. And I can say maybe the next time, um, you know, we can do it outside so I can smoke my cigar. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And you know, I, I guess I have one more parting message cause I don't want to be also doom and gloom. Hey. Guam has, for all our people, we're the most, we are resilient, huh? We are. I've always believed, I've always believed if the world were ever to come to an end through some sort of nuclear holocaust or Armageddon, there's only be two things left in, uh, alive, cockroaches and the people of Guam. <laughs> we are one durable people. We've gone through so much. And, and, you know, think about it. Anyone who's talked to their parents or their grandparents or look at the history of Guam, we always get through it. So, um... You know, I'm confident in things. I, I then the the formula for Guam, where where strategically we're there, Guam is becoming the most strategic American uh, uh, soil uh, in in all of Pacific, you know, right. other than maybe Hawaii. Uh, but we are we are at the front line. We are, so, especially as, with know, South China Sea yeah. popping and, off, you know, every day. Exactly. So what's going to happen because of our strategic value? Um, you know, there's going to be a focus on Guam. And with that means, and you hate to say it, you know, hopefully there's no bombs, but that means there's opportunities in the economic side of things. Uh, we're still such a beautiful piece of paradise that, you know, most, a lot of Asians will want to visit Guam. Um, so, you know, things will write themselves out, particularly in industries such as tourism. We, we are also, and since we're talking about technology and the woke people who know about technology, even when I was governor, aside from maybe Singapore, we're the most, when it comes to uh, submarine fiber optic cables, we're the most wired place in, in the planet. Yeah, the most, can we, uh, we, yeah, connect, every, we connect the continent to, well, to Japan. Right? Most of the stuff going on between Australia, New Zealand, I- Asia, and North America has to go through Guam. And then aside from that, you, know, you see all the tech companies here, um, you know, because of our military importance, you know, you see all those little round, those round balls in northern Guam. Mm-hmm. Those aren't big golf balls. That we're one of the few places that that there's there's also communications that come through through you know extraterrestrial space, mm-hmm. and so we're a, a major area when it comes to information from space and connecting information, uh, 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 submarine wise, from different locations in the world. Everything goes through Guam. So, so as the, as as a, you know, part of the United States, we are we are so important. It's kind of weird. We've always been like that. We're such a small little place. You know, if it wasn't for us, Magellan would have never. Yeah, he he would have never made it. Or <laughs> right. well, he would have died. You know, he would have died in the ocean rather than <laughs> right, in the right, Philippines. Right, 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 right. And you know, obviously, a lot of folks re- re- understand you. You know, history in, in in terms of a lot of the global, you know, great powers and empires. You know, Guam has always been there. Yeah. Uh, and so we're continuing and the people somehow who, the currents brought all yeah, these Spanish always, and you know, German we, forget, right? yeah heck we all seem to be there you know in the middle of everything so with it it's about you know island that it's in terms of significance to not only the United States the world we are much higher in terms of significance stra- strategy wise than it our size and our population because of how important we are to world affairs so we should take advantage of that. I think our people should take more control of our lives. Yeah. And I go back to self determination, <clears> but then at the same time, we're like a we're like a diamond in the rough. And I think there's just so much more up. And I, the reason I say it is, you know, so we talk about tourism, uh, and we talk about the military, but in the world of technology and communications, you know that that we're only going to grow, uh, and so we got to be innovative. 
um, you know, heck, before I left, I met with the president of Virgin Orbit. And, you know, I'm, I'm surprised it's taken so long, but, you know, Virgin Orbit uh, had already identified Guam as an area for... for um, spaceport. Uh, spaceport. Right. And, you know, I know we were working on, on uh, the AB Wampan International Airport. It takes some time to get that designation. At the time, Chuck Atta and the airport board were working on it. But then at the same time, they were working with Anderson Air Force Base. So supposedly we're going to get, you know, even before Wampat Airport becomes a, a, a spaceport, you know, we, we there was an anticipation that um, payloads would be taken off from Anderson through those, you know, those um, the, the, the Virgin Orbit, uh, uh, um, you know, platform, which is a 747, and with a 747 taken off with a, with a with a rocket under its uh, mm-hmm. under its tail and, and able to especially now with CubeSats these might you know these um, these little satellites yeah, I'm not familiar yeah well they're able to you know because he, because of the the ability to shrink everything down in size you know you can you can take these payloads even though the weight is not you know great there's a, the ability to bring all these CubeSat minor uh, small satellites <laughs> okay. and shoot them up in a in a space so you know that technology was there. So there's so much potential for Guam. In fact, that's why we're talking to university at the time. And, you know, now, thank God we've done it, you know, the School of Engineering, because we wanted to get a local population and give them the ne- the necessary skills that p- potentially could plug us in in terms of employment and entrepreneurship into these areas of technology. You know, right now, even right now, we've got these global hawks, we've got these atomic nuclear submarines, we've got so much high-tech stuff, all these Corporations are bringing in technicians and contractors from the continental United States to work on 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 a lot of these facilities and equipment. It costs a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, we get enough people trained here in Guam, then then those corporations can hire local people. Right. And those are the things that we you know again are us as a community got to focus and work on in the year in the years ahead. So I, I got a lot of confidence in Guam. Yeah. We can get to it, folks. Yeah, it's just time to wake up, right? Got to wake up. Yeah. And anyway, thank you so much. I know we's, oh my gosh, this let's was do it again. Yeah, yeah, you know it's uh, and let's not make it uh, three years. Every three, yeah, we'll do it again. Uh, <laughs> we'll do it before the year ends for sure. Either pre or post election, just to see how things go. Okay, that okay. sounds good. I, I love to that be. That sounds poli- fun. I'm not in the. I'm not running for anything anymore, but I'm a great political uh, prognosticator. Yeah, yeah. What is commentary. what is your what is your outlook? Oh man, you, be, um, you know, I mean, uh, it's still, it's still ju- early. It's still early, right? So, I mean, what is your outlook as well, to what is, what could I think we got people you know, potentially, you know? I think go for. the Republican side, there's a there's a team forming. I think it'll be a formidable Republican team, uh, and you know, obviously, I would like to see um, you know our, our style of government governance in terms of uh, uh, a, a governor and an administration that believe more in the people. And not are focusing on dic- on mi- dictatorial uh, mandates, yeah. but and, and, and focusing on civil liberties and allowing people to be the you know be the best that they are can be. Right. So you know I'm hopeful as that moves along. Then at the same time I see in the Democratic side some interesting things occurring. You know you have a a governor that has uh, you know in place an incumbent the power of incumbency is always strong mm-hmm. has a lot of money particularly the federal side, but there's potentially that congressman you know and he's um, I heard he's intending to run, and he's he's formidable. He's he's um, done he's, very well in he's elections. Very popular, right? Yeah, very popular. So, you know, that will be dynamic uh, in terms of what I see happening in in the Democratic Party in terms of a primary, which makes it for you know, God, now I'm I'm not in that <laughs> arena anymore. But it, man, it just makes it very dramatic and uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, exciting. Sure. So, I'll be you know I'll be interested to see how things moves along. But I got to put a caveat here. You know, I'm Republican. And I'm there to support all Republicans, and so you know I'll be giving whatever advice and support I can to, you know, whatever Republican team is out there, either in the gubernatorial, or the congressional, or the legislative race. Maybe we can get your own podcast going. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sound like too bad of an idea, right? <laughs> well, thanks a lot, my man. And again, it was a pleasure. I look forward to being a part of this program in the next few months ahead. Okay? Yeah, for sure. All right, partners. Thanks, Take care. One more time. God uh, bless you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And uh, see you next time. Bye. Ooh, we. What a conversation with Eddie Baza Calvo. I hope you enjoyed that one. I just enjoy having conversations with him in general. Um, 
He's such a great person to talk to. I'm trying to convince him to start his own podcast, so we'll see how that goes. It is election year, and it just makes all the sense for him to do one. So working on that, I told him I'd produce it for him, and we'll see what happens. Uh, just going back to my little spiel, uh, your time is precious. Make good use of your time, better use of your time, because uh, you can never get it back. This is it. I've, I'm, I'm 35 this year, and technically I've lived half of my life. My expected life, who knows, I could go before. So think about that, take care of everything you need to do, and until next time, peace.